But let's just uh, pick up a little bit of information that we uh, shared with you last week. Uh, we read about Jesus' final trip from his home in the north in the region of Galilee. So he's on his way, you know, the final time to Jerusalem. You know, as he journeys towards Jerusalem, we see him continue his ministry of teaching and healing uh, along the way. Uh, in the previous lesson, we examined his meeting, you know, especially we foc there were a lot of things going on as he traveled from Galilee down to Jerusalem, but we focused in on his meeting with the rich young ruler and how this man, because of his love of wealth, uh, his dependence on wealth, uh, refuses the calling of Jesus. You know, the king calls him and he, he, doesn't, he doesn't respond. And so in this week's uh, lesson, we're going to see Jesus preparing to enter into the city where he's going to suffer a series of challenges and rejections culminating in his crucifixion. So this uh, lesson title for today is The King's House. I call it The King's House because most of the action will center in and around and about the temple in Jerusalem and Jesus' worthiness to claim that temple as his own. Um, now, so the first visit to the temple, uh, for the Jews, we need to understand a little bit of background about the temple itself. For the Jews, the temple was the seat of God's power. Uh, God dwelled among them in the form of the temple, not necessarily the bricks, but God's presence was there, represented by the temple. He dwelled with His people. Uh, it was the center of religious and political and social and commercial life. I mean, it was the hub. Your standing at the temple determined your standing within Jewish society. As you were at the temple, as they recognized you at the temple, you were recognized in society in general. And so it's this hierarchy that Jesus, or, or rather within this hierarchy, Jesus stood at the top of the list by virtue of the fact that He was the divine Messiah, He was the purpose, He was the reason for the temple. Uh, and so he, he was at the top. Now, the temple was built to exercise the Jewish religion, which was created to prepare the people and to prepare the world for the coming of the Savior. So there was no one that had a higher position than Jesus as the divine uh, Messiah. So we see you know, in Matthew that uh, now the Savior, He's here. He's ready to be recognized by His people. However, we see that instead of welcoming Him to the place that was rightfully His, the Jews uh, of that time ultimately rejected and tortured and executed Him. Now, you know, sometimes you, when you say something like that in public, you, you become uh, accused you know, of being uh, anti-Semitic. You know, you're against the Jews and so on and so forth. An easy, uh, uh, an easy uh, uh, attack to make. Uh, but what I'm saying here is that the Jews of that time, of that period, especially the leadership of that time, in collusion with the Roman leadership, they're the ones who were responsible for uh, uh, crucifying Jesus. That, that's not conjecture. You know, that's not bigotry, that's history. That's just simple history. Okay? We're not saying that a Jewish person today is the one that did it, of course not. But it's historically accurate to say that the Jewish leadership of that time and the Roman leadership of that time in that period, they're the ones that worked together to, uh, to put him to death. And so this, this terrible chain of events began on a rather high note, actually, as Jesus arrives from the northern country and he prepares to enter into Jerusalem and into the temple which are rightfully his. So now you have the coming, and if I break this lesson down, you have the coming of, of Jesus, would be in chapter 21, we're going to write about this, or read about this rather. So let's read 21, beginning in verse one. It says, when they had approached Jerusalem and he had come to Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. He says, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately He will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Verse five, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, 
gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And so some are confused you know, with the idea of the two animals. Is it one donkey or is it two? What, what, what is it? It says a donkey and her foal or colt. Well, the idea was that Jesus was to enter Jerusalem as a prophet. And Zechariah spoke of this, the prophet Zechariah spoke of the Messiah entering into uh, Jerusalem. Now the prophet said that unlike human kings and saviors who rode in a victory parade on a horse, God's king and God's savior would enter the city in a much more humble fashion. He would come in on a colt that had never been ridden, thus demonstrating his humility and also his, his purity. Now the second animal, the, the foal's mother, that animal was brought along to steady and to, reassure, uh, to reassure the, young, the younger animal. Remember it says a young animal never been ridden. And so you've got the second animal there, the mother of that young animal there to, to calm that animal down and so the procession could go forward without, uh, without a problem. As in many cases, the people, especially the poor, they're thrilled to see uh, Jesus arriving as the, scriptures, um, as the scriptures predicted to the seat of power. Now they may have thought that with Jesus in Jerusalem, things would change. You know, the people, wow, this guy does miracles, he helps the poor, he's approachable, he speaks wisdom, so on and so forth. My, well, there's going to be a change. Isn't that what politicians always say? You watch, the election's coming, right? If they had a clip of every politician that was running, usually it's the same thing. You know, we're tired of the old guys. You know, vote for me, there's going to be a change. You know? So sometimes what you get is, and now I'm being cynical, sometimes what you get is no change at all or a change that you didn't want. You know? so, but anyways, the same idea here. People are happy, there's going to be a change, something's going to happen. Now, once into the city itself, the procession kind of causes a stir among the people and Matthew gives us a, a kind of a short clip of a conversation between a group accompanying the Lord in the procession and also the people in the city itself. So he gives us kind of a snapshot of what's going, you know, the, the focus is on Jesus and then he kind of looks at the people and he gives us a little bit about what, what's going on with the people. Now remember that most of Jesus' ministry has been done in the north, around Galilee. And the people accompanying him point proudly to the fact that the great prophet is from the north. He's one of us, look, look, he's from the north, he's from our hometown, he's, he's a northern guy. Very proud, you see. But we're going to see as we continue on that this is going to be as good as it gets for the Lord because once he goes into the temple, the opposition will begin to grow. Okay, so now we move on to the next part of this uh, entry into Jerusalem, the, uh, the cleansing, chapter 21, verses 12 to 17. So let's read that. It says, And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. He said to them, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and he went out of the, of the city to Bethany 
and he spent the night there. Now it helps to understand that what's happening here if we realize the reason Jesus was indignant with the people. Why, why did he cleanse the temple? What was the problem? You have to understand that it was okay to sell animals because, and change money because the law required people to sacrifice animals. That was the main uh, style of worship at the temple. And as I said, it was okay to exchange money because Jewish pilgrims came from all over the world to worship at Jerusalem. And so they needed their foreign currency exchanged so they could purchase animals for sacrifice and also pay for the temple tax. Some people who lived near brought their own animals, but if you lived you know, three, four hundred miles away, you didn't bring your animal with you, you bought an animal there for the purpose of sacrifice. Now, so that wasn't the problem. The problem was that there were plenty of spaces outside and near the temple walls to do this trading that was necessary for the functioning of the temple. Now what the Jewish leaders had permitted, however, was to allow these merchants to conveniently set up their animal stalls and their money tables within the walls of the temple itself. That was the problem. Now the temple, you know, the, the holy place, the holy of holies, you know, the buildings there, these things were surrounded by various courtyards that were closed off. So you had, you had the courtyard of the priests and the Levites, only they could go there. And then you had the courtyard of the men, Jewish men, only Jewish men could go there. You had the courtyard of the women, only Jewish women could go there. And then the largest courtyard of all was the courtyard of the Gentiles and into the courtyard of the Gentiles only converts could go. People who were not born naturally or culturally into the Jewish race, but had converted to the Jewish religion from paganism. Their courtyard was actually the largest of the courtyards. Now with time, the leaders had allowed trade and money changing to go on in the courtyard of the Gentiles. And that was a no-no because this defiled their only area of worship since they couldn't mix with the men, couldn't go to the men's courtyard, the women couldn't go, that was only for the Jews. They only had one place and their courtyard was the furthest away from the buildings. So that was the only place that they could go to. And so by setting up the animals and the money changers, uh, this was a form of bigotry uh, and disrespect for them and disrespect for God. And so Jesus chases them out and he quotes a passage from Isaiah the prophet where Isaiah spoke of the day when even Gentiles would worship the true God and God's temple would universally become a house of prayer for both Jews and Gentiles. That's what that quote is about. And so by desecrating their courtyard, the Jews were denying these people their chance to worship properly and they were frustrating the plans of God for His temple and for all of the people. That was the sin, that was the problem, that's what Jesus was taking care of and pointing out here. So after chasing them out, Jesus heals those who come to Him in faith and He receives the praise offered to Him by children. Now it's not that the king was not received at the temple. He was acknowledged by those who were furthest down on the scale of importance, those who were infirmed and children. So in the, in the social scale, in the Jewish social scale, I mean children and then those who were handicapped in some way or another, they were at the absolute bottom of the heap. And we see that, on, that Matthew says only the children and only the infirm greeted him and welcomed him. The leaders, however, they did not welcome him. Those entrusted with the leadership, the teaching, the preparation of the people and the temple for the coming of the Messiah, they refused to accept his credentials. And what's really interesting is even after they witnessed his miracles within the very walls of the temple itself, they still refused to acknowledge who he was. And so they don't welcome him, they rebuke him for receiving the praise and honor from the children, suggesting that it was improper for a mere man to receive such praise 
reserved only for God. And I mean, that's true. You, you, know, you can't praise an ordinary human being as God, but He was God. He was the divine Messiah. So Jesus then directly quotes Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, where David declares that God's majesty is so evident, even children recognize it, even children proclaim it. You know, it's one of the things that we always say, you know, when the summer comes, you don't have to arm wrestle a kid to come to VBS. You don't have to talk them into it, you don't have to bribe them. You, know? you say VBS and if they've ever been to VBS, oh, they can't wait to come. And if they come one night, they just get one night of it, oh, they want to come back. You know, the idea of the innocence of children, they love to hear about God and they love to hear uh, about Jesus. So this was a rebuke to these men who saw themselves as spiritual leaders but who had less insight concerning Jesus than even the little children that were, um, uh, that were praising Him. So we have the coming, we have the cleansing, and then the next section is the cursing. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 18. Let's read that. It says, now in the morning when He was returning to the city, remember He went, he went out, He went to Bethany, Bethany rather, spent the night, probably Lazarus, Mary, Martha, that's where He usually stayed. It says, now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did the fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. Verse 22, and all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So as I say, the Lord spends the night in Bethany before returning the next day to the holy city. Um, the scene with the fig tree is a it's called the living parable, a living parable. You know, a lot of times he, he says parables, he tells a story. Here there isn't a story, the, the, the actual action is the parable uh, itself. And it takes, um, um, uh, this parable is a mirror of what is taking place between Jesus and the nation that will reject Him. So uh, a little bit about fig trees. Fig trees produce their fruit first and then the leaves follow gradually. So first there's the fruit, then there are the leaves because the leaves will signify that the fruit is now present. So seeing the leaves from far off, Jesus fully expects to have fruit from the tree as there should be. It was the time for fruit, you know, the time of year for fruit, but the tree only produced the leaves. In other words, a promise unfulfilled, the leaves but no figs. So Jesus curses the tree, not out of anger. Some people you know, are thinking, he was hungry and he was crabby. You know, that's me, that's not Jesus. You know, I get crabby when I'm hungry. So it's not like he's crabby or mad or anything. You know, he, he sends it to its demise with a word. It, it's not good for anything. It's a fig tree that doesn't produce figs. And so he says, hey, you know, you're, you're not worth anything. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. So we, you know, usually if it, if it was a farmer, we wouldn't be mad at a farmer for digging it up and throwing it out and planting another tree, right? So Jesus simply does it, but in a miraculous way. Now the parallel, this is where we have to kind of, the parallel of course, is that Jesus has come at the right time to save His people and there are signs that they are ready. Right? There's the temple worship going on. There are teachers teaching the word. There are all the exterior signs of a religious people. In other words, the leaves are out. The leaves are out. But the fruit that Jesus is looking for from them is the fruit of faith and righteousness and brotherly love. The fruit is not present among the trappings of their external religions. There's the parallel. That's how the parable of the fig tree parallels what's going on between Jesus and the nation, uh, the Jewish nation at that time. So the lesson is that what happens to the fig tree, that's what's going to happen to the nation. 
it will be destroyed to the point where it will not be able to produce fruit anymore. And so the apostles are amazed, wanting to know, you know how, how Jesus has done this to the, to the fig tree. And his answer is a reassurance that the same power at work to you know, wither the tree will be at work in them for the purpose of the gospel. See this power I've just demonstrated? This is the kind of power you're going to have when you begin preaching the gospel. Their preaching and their teaching after he is gone will be met with an equally great opposition, if you wish, a mountain of opposition. And their faith in preaching the gospel and persevering in it will remove that mountain. That's the idea. The lesson of the fig tree is twofold. For the Jews, the lesson is your lack of faith will destroy you. For the apostles, the lesson is, your faith will empower you. Your faith will empower you, okay? And so we move on to Jesus' second visit to the temple, uh, chapter 21, I'm not going to read that right now. On the second day, Jesus comes to the temple again, but this time He makes a less spectacular entrance. No donkey, no parade, nothing. He just goes to the temple quietly. On this second visit, the various Jewish leaders are ready for him, and each of them take turns disputing his authority or discrediting his claims. They make an attempt anyways. Matthew describes what happens as Jesus alternates between confrontations with the leaders and responses to them in the form of parables spoken to the people. So get the scene, all right? Get the scene. If there was a script, this is how it would work. The, the leaders come and they confront him, he responds to them, and then while they're digesting his response, he gives a parable to the people who are observing you know, the exchange. And usually the parable is explaining to the people, especially the believers, what's going on here between him and the opposition. So the action flows, okay? Again, don't have time to read everything, but the action flows this way. The various leaders attack him in some way or another, Jesus responds to their attacks directly. He then teaches the crowds concerning the attacks before His attackers in parables. So the people, uh, among the people, only the believers will understand the contents. And of course, this drives His antagonists crazy. I mean, He, he answers them, He puts them down, and then tells a parable making them look bad on top of that. So they're, they're ready to plan His, his death. Now, we don't have time to read, I said, as, or go into detail concerning each encounter and then the subsequent teaching. So I'm going to give you an overview of the different scenes as they happen. Though the very first scene is a challenge from the priests and the elders. In verse 23, I'll read that in a second. As he enters the temple area on the second visit and he begins teaching the crowds, he's immediately challenged by some priests and elders, probably members of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, we know this was the ruling body of the Jews. They challenge his legitimacy and his credentials to teach in the temple an area that they control. In other words, who do you think you are coming in here to teach? We're the teachers. We're the ones that give the, you know, the okay for teaching. And so they challenged him, you know, who are you? So if he claims his deity, if he says, well, I'm the Savior, I'm the divine Messiah, you know, if he says that, they're going to stone him. And then if he denies his deity, then they'll, di they'll, then they'll dismiss him. Well, if you're not the Messiah, what are you doing here? What are, what are you teaching? So Jesus replies with a question about John the Baptist and what authority he taught by. Okay, so now let's read. It says, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I'll also ask you one thing which you tell me. Uh, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source, from heaven or from men? And they began reasoning among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say, from men, we fear the people, for they all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. And he also said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So as Jesus replies with a question to John the Baptist, you know, they said, never mind what authority I have. Well, 
who do you think gave John the Baptist his authority? So they're, they're caught now, they're caught. So they refuse to answer and Jesus does the same, kind of a checkmate, checkmate. All right? So that's the first encounter. Then there are parables and teachings for the people while the leaders are looking on. So they've had this discussion and then Jesus follows this up with a parable. And it's the parable of the two sons. Um, after the confrontation, Jesus tells several parables, and the first one being a simple story of two sons asked to work by their father. One son says yes, but he doesn't do it. The other says no at first, but then changes his mind and he obeys later on. So Jesus explains that those who display, excuse me, those who disobey and repent will be received by God. And those who um, uh, merely give lip service to God, like these Pharisees, they'll be condemned. So that's the parable, and the parable you know, specifically speaks to the leaders that have just confronted him. And then there's the parable of the landowner. He follows with another parable. Again, same scene. Um, in this parable, a landowner who leases his land and equipment to others to work. And when he sends his people to collect his share at the harvest, the workers beat and they kill them. And in the parable, Jesus says, finally, the, the, the landowner sends his own son to collect and they murder him. And because of this, the landowner will come to destroy these workers and rent the property out to others uh, so that the, they will pay their dues. Again, Jesus goes on to explain that this parable is about the Jews and what will happen to them if they reject God's Son. All the while, these leaders are standing there listening to Him say this to the people. So in the end, Matthew writes that the chief priests and Pharisees were enraged that He spoke against them and they began to plot to kill Him. Now, the gloves are off. The gloves are off. No just polite debate. And now we're going, to, we're going to get rid of this guy. Then there's another parable, he says, and this is the parable of the marriage feast, Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Again, don't have time to read it. Uh, we're, I think we're familiar uh, with this one. Jesus is aware of their intentions and he responds with yet another parable, this time one about a marriage feast. In this parable, a king prepares a great feast, but none of the invited guests come, each of them giving some lame excuse. And so in the parable, the king responds by inviting strangers, the poor, the disenfranchised. Remember the ones at the bottom of the heap, the children, the infirm? They're the ones that responded to Jesus. So the echo of that is in the parable. Who comes? You know, the people on the highways, the poor people, disenfranchised. They're the ones that come to the king's feast. Now the point here is that the Jews were first invited to share the kingdom with Christ. But through their lack of faith, they refused. So God has called the non-Jews to share in His kingdom. Today, we don't, you know, we're all non-Jews. So we go, yeah, so? But if you were a Jew, that was, that was, wow, it was unheard of. You spent a whole life keeping yourself separate from the Gentiles, and then the Messiah says, oh, by the way, you're not coming in, the Gentiles are coming in. So once again, a thinly disguised rebuke of the leaders for their lack of faith and the consequences. One thing to say, you, you men don't believe in me, that's one thing to say that, but to go further and say, and you will be condemned because of it. That's, that was really what was getting to them. All right, so now we have another, another challenge, not from, the, um, not from the priests or the leaders, this time um, from the Pharisees. Um, Let's read, I think I've got this one down. Yeah, it says, then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one. You're not partial to any. So tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, why are you testing me? you hypocrites, show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed. And leaving him, they went their way. So the dilemma here is that if Jesus said, yes, it's okay to pay the tax, 
they would have then denounced him as a pagan sympathizer. And if he said, no, it's not okay to pay the tax, then they would accuse him of stirring up a rebellion. It was like a no-win no -win situation. So Jesus answers with the essential truth of the matter. Do your duty in the human realm, and then do your duty in the spiritual realm. And with that answer, he silences uh, these attackers. All right, another challenge comes up, and this is of the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they were priests, but they were priests who came from the upper class, the wealthy and the noble families. They were a, a certain type of, of, of um, uh, high society, if you wish, in, in the Jewish culture. Now, we need to understand that the priests, or the Sadducees, they only believed or held that the five, first five books of the law, the Pentateuch, only these five books were authoritative. So they did not believe in the prophets, any of the prophets, they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in resurrection or anything, just the first five books of the Bible, that's all they, uh, that's all they saw as legitimate. And so they come along and they challenge him with a riddle. It's not a Bible question, it's a riddle about a woman with seven husbands and they ask him, you know, whose wife will she be uh, of the seven when she dies? You know, the idea is, you know, she marries the first one, he dies, and then the second one takes her as wife, and he dies, and the third, fourth, fifth, all the way to the seventh. They all have her as wife, they all die, and then they say to him, okay, so now when they all go to heaven, whose wife will they be? So it's really insulting. They're just making fun of him, because they don't believe in heaven. They don't believe in the afterlife. So they throw in this riddle to try to uh, mock him. So um, Jesus answers, very interesting, by using a passage from Exodus, that's one of their five books, okay? And not only solves the riddle, but also demonstrates that the afterlife and heaven are spoken of even in the Pentateuch. You know, he tells them, you know, hey, you know, God is the God of Abraham, I am, you know, in the passage says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac. Not I was, I am, present tense, okay? So he uses just good Bible interpretation to knock down their argument and to establish the idea that even in the first five books of the Bible, the ones that they accepted, they teach the afterlife. They teach resurrection and so on and so forth. So of course this silences them, also ridicules the Sadducees and it delights the people because the people are ignorant in the sense that they don't have a lot of education, so they can't debate these guys. So they see an ordinary, a guy from Nazareth come along, put them down, answer all their questions. You know, he's a hero to these people. Okay, so then we have another challenge, this time of the Pharisees. They come back for another round. One final time, okay? A tricky question. Uh, there are going to be other challenges, but they will come later on after he's arrested. So this time the Pharisees, seeing that the Sadducees have been silenced, they come to Jesus asking which commandment is great in the law? Which commandment is great in the law? Now this was, uh, this, there were a lot of issues hidden in, the, it sounds simple, but there were a lot of issues hidden in this questions. For example, Sadducees and Pharisees, they disagreed on what was important in the scriptures. As I said, the Sadducees, they only accepted the first five books. The Pharisees, they accepted all of the writings, the prophets, they believed in resurrection, they believed in angels, and so on and so forth. All right. But in addition to this, the Pharisees created 613 commands, 248 positive commands, 365 negative commands as a kind of a protective ring or protective shield around the law. In other words, man-made rules and regulations that were supposed to, quote, help people keep the law. Now, another unusual thing they did was that they assigned numerical value to the Hebrew letters in these commands. You understand? So if there was a command, not, not the Bible command, but the rules that they made, every letter in the rules that they made had a numerical value. So when one of these rules came into conflict with another rule, uh, they would weigh the value of the rule by the numerical uh, value that it contained. I know it sounds a little weird, eh? but they, 
okay, this rule conflicts with this rule, which one has precedence? Well, what's the numerical value of this rule? They count up the letters. You know, each letter would have a numerical value. They total it up, they total up on this side, and the, the one that had the biggest numerical value, that, that's the rule that had precedence. That, and they debated this endlessly, okay? So their question had two purposes. One, they wanted to further embarrass their religious rivals, the Sadducees, by getting Jesus to side with them. And they wanted Jesus' opinion on a matter, which, you know, which law had the highest value, see what I'm saying, that they debated over. So Jesus answers by going to the heart of the matter, citing that the love of God and the love of one fellow man as, as oneself, this is the greatest command. Now, this was not based on rivalry or formula, but on a true summary of all the teaching of the Old Testament. It was so undeniably true that the Pharisees did not answer or did not respond negatively. It's like, yeah, how, how can you argue with that? You know? Who do you love? I love my mother. Oh, who's going to argue with that one? Who's going to debate you on that one? Which is the greatest command? to love God with all your heart and soul and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Who's going to debate you on that one? Okay. So the question is one they cannot answer because it can only be discerned through faith in Jesus, something they didn't have, because he asks them a question, quoting a, a particular uh, passage out of the psalm. All right, need to move. The final rebuke, Matthew 23. In this chapter, Jesus is going to deliver a stinging rebuke directly to the leaders and the teachers of the Jews for their failure to prepare uh, the people for His coming, because it's their fault. He came, the people were not ready. Whose fault is it? Their fault. So the chapter 23 that ends this section and ends this lesson, it contains seven woes or seven accusations and it finishes with Jesus' lament over the coming destruction of the city and of the temple, which he will describe in the following chapter, which we will do in our next lesson. Talk about you know, how he describes the end of the Jewish nation. So we see in our lesson today that the king came to his city, he came to his temple, he came to his people, and they were not ready. They were worse than not ready. They actually confronted and challenged his royal position. They actually challenged him as the divine Messiah. And this is after the miracles and the teachings and so on and so forth. So in the end, he refutes their challenges and he mourns the loss of their opportunity to become the true temples of God in Jesus Christ. All right, so that's our lesson about the king and his kingdom. The, uh, the king's house, the, true, the temple truly belonging to Jesus. Next week we're going to talk about that Matthew 24, that, that long complicated passage about you know, the destruction of the temple, 70 AD, the end of the world and the signs and all of that. You know, one taken, one left behind. We'll talk about that next time. All right, thank you for your attention.